Hello and welcome to today's webinar in partnership with Constantia Flexibles hosted by Packaging Europe. Today we'll learn about the future of flexible film packaging in a circular economy from the experts at Constantia Flexibles, Reciclas and Reckitt So my name is Elisabeth Skura, I'm one of the editors at Packaging Europe. Uh, so for those of you unfamiliar with Packaging Europe, we are the leading intelligence resource for European packaging professionals via our magazine and website, as well as our online and in-person events such as the Sustainability Awards and Sustainable Packaging Summit. We deliver daily news content, authoritative comment and analysis, case studies and high profile interview interviews with leading industry players. And we enable communication across the packaging value chain. So for today's webinar, we are joined by Achim Griefenstein, who is Senior Vice President Group R&D at Constantia Flexibles. Uh, we have Fabrizio Di Gregorio, who is Technical Director at Reciclas. And last but definitely not least, we have Martin Settler, who is uh, Senior Manager for Polymer Science at Reckitt Benkiser. So uh, yeah, welcome uh, to all three of you and uh, yeah, looking forward to um, hearing your insights. And um, yeah, our speakers today will focus on the circular economy and recycling, which obviously, as we all know, are hot topics in the packaging industry today. And uh, in this live webinar, you'll gain insights into the world of recycling from three different perspectives across the packager, the value chain. So, and Constantia Flexibles will explain its complete sustainability approach and after that the main benefits and characteristics of film as a material will be presented and the development of the material throughout the year will also be, uh, throughout the years, will also be covered. And uh, our first guest, Reciclas, will take an in-depth look at EU recycling guidelines and how they influence uh, the current recycling world. They will also touch upon why monomaterials instead of mixed PO should be favoured and how the mono PP recycling stream works currently. And our second guest, Reckitt, will then talk about the sustainability product tra strategy with a focus on their mono PE products. Furthermore, they will explain their experience with the switch from multi-layer laminates to monomaterials. Um, so before we get um, started with the, um, the webinar, um, just a couple of housekeeping tips. There are 50 minutes at the end of this webinar reserved to a Q&A. So um, using the chat facility, please direct message us with your questions and we can put them to our speakers at the end of the session. You can do this throughout the entire webinar and we'll obviously try to get as many of your questions answered as possible. Um, um, if, if we don't get to your question, don't worry, we can, uh, you can also get in touch with, um, with the speakers afterwards. There'll be an, an email address up on screen. <coughs> And um, for any technical questions, please select the support button, which you will see the on the left hand side of the screen. For streaming related issues, you can also use the help button on the bottom right of the stream window. So, um, yeah, to get us started, some quick information about Constantia Flexibles. The uh, company was founded on the guiding principles of people, passion, packaging and uh, manufactures tailor-made flexible packaging solutions. And with around 8,750 employees, the company is the second biggest producer in Europe and number three globally and has a worldwide presence with 38 production sites. Its headquarters are located in, uh, in Austria, in, in Austria's capital, Vienna. and. Um, Europe is the company's biggest market, followed by um, the Americas, Asia Pacific and the Middle East and Africa. It serves the consumer sector, which makes up the major, major share of its business with 75% and also the pharma sector with 25%. And 54% uh, of the company's output is aluminium based. And we heard more about this in a previous webinar, which is still available on demand. And 44% um, of the production share is made up of flexible packaging. And obviously, as you know, we'll delve deeper into this topic today. Flexible plastics, I should say. <laughs> and um, last but not least, there's also paper-based packaging, um, currently 2%, but uh, steadily growing. So um, yeah, with that, I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, Achim Griefenstein, who will um, help us dive, deep, deep, dive a bit deeper into, into the topic. Yeah. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that uh, kind introduction. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, yeah, sustainability has a long tradition within Constantia. We have uh, founded a dedicated uh, sustainability department. Please go to the next slide. 
uh, more than 50 years ago. Uh, we have founded it within our R&D team in order to make sure that uh, what we do on sustainability is uh, scientific backed uh, in order to be uh, sure that we work according to the latest uh, science. I have today not the time to go on all the aspects of a uh, full ESG roadmap, but uh, the left three points, recyclability of products, uh, collaboration along the value chain, and of course, also reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, which is also associated with recyclable products, will be tackled during the webinar. Next slide, please. Yeah, if you look on today packaging, you see we are dealing with a lot of multi-material uh, laminates, either laminates of different incompatible plastics like polyester NPE or OPA NPE, or laminates of uh, plastics with aluminium and or paper. All these structures are non-recyclable, and as you can see in the broad variety here on these pictures, they have very different uh, requirements and how to fulfill that with recyclable products that you can see on the next slide. After uh, several years of intensive R&D work, we can say that we are quite on a good track to make all products in our complex portfolio recyclable by 25. That means we will have recyclable alternatives for all products available. And um, how are we doing that? Uh, with our so-called evolutions, we uh, have maximized the amount of the target material, in that case, aluminum or paper, which is today not the topic, and PE or PP. We have rapidly seen that uh, mixed polyfins is not a good idea, as you will later on also hear from the recycling experts. Um, and one might ask, what product to use where? Well, of course. Beside of recyclability, functionality is key. And uh, for wrappers, for example, only paper or aluminium would give uh, good deadfold properties. Only some special plastics, uh, mineral filled plastics, have also good deadfold, but there are recyclability issues. So for wrappers, definitely it will be, in most cases, not be plastic. But we see for flow packs and pouches and all tight sealed uh, packs that plastics is a material of the future either in form of mono-PE or mono-PP. And here, to our strong belief, it's mostly the sealant which is deciding where to use what. In the vast majority of all applications, PE, mono-PE can do a good job. But of course, there are applications like retortable packaging or other packaging where you need higher stiffness or thermal resistance, where PP and mono-PP is an indispensable material. All these materials are associated to the lower carbon footprint. In the next slide, you see some details about uh, our journey here uh, on that development. As I said, such a development doesn't happen overnight. We started quite early. We started uh, here uh, in the middle of the last decade already with some basic R&D work on mono PE, where we have seen that such materials are not, uh, oriented PE is not available on the market in a good quality. And then, under the influence of the Indian ban of multi-material laminates, we industrialized the first applications in India and subsequently even invested in India. And the whole development was done in a tight cooperation between our German central R&D and the Indian plant, uh, having uh, industrialized the first applications. With the Indian factory starting in 2019, we have also started the market development in Europe where we have today two production plans for our mono PE. And beside of the mono PE, of course, we have also uh, recently got the approval of our uh, recyclable pharma products, our perpetual hybrid. Later on, more about that. Next slide, please. Yeah, Ecolam is um, a portfolio uh, of mono PE with different barrier values. We have the, let's say, base version, an Ecolam uh, with having water vapor barrier. Then the Ecolam Plus has an additional oxygen barrier and aroma barrier. And the Ecolam High Plus is uh, uh, so called the Mercedes in that range. It has barrier values, as you can see, which are very low, close to that of aluminium, which has an infinite barrier. And we are quite convinced with such barriers, you can uh, tackle almost all applications uh, in the market. The 
whole family consists of at least one oriented film and in the next slide you can see a little bit more about that building block system. We have uh, as a printable layer an oriented PE film, um, then in the middle a barrier layer and a ceiling layer. Sometimes also a duplex uh, variation of a transparent barrier layer being printed together and laminated with a ceiling layer is doing the job. So that means we have either duplex or triplex structures and all these oriented films in the portfolio um, are chosen according to the specific applications requests and then are combined with uh, also a family of special ceiling films which allow us to have a broad ceiling window. Next slide please. You, you can see a little bit more on that how the structures or typical structures for Ecolam, Ecolam Plus and High Plus are looking like and uh, some uh, USPs of these products. We have only 20 micron of oriented film thickness and despite of that low thickness, we uh, can gravier print and not only flexo print on that material. We have also special heat resistant outer layers giving our customers a broader ceiling window on the packaging line. Um, and the whole product uh, can be laminated in different processes, either extrusion lamination, solvent, based oven free and as already said uh, the whole package is rounded up by a special family of ceiling films having all low seal initial temperature uh, and different functionality from peelable to stiff films to easy curable films etc next slide please yeah, the whole family was approved as first monomaterial and high barrier monomaterial uh, by RACI class uh, already in the year 2019. And we have also here letters of compatibility by certified auditors here for these uh, family members. And it's important to mention here um, that uh, the Eclam High Plus is including some metallization, which is today a needed technology to achieve highest barrier. And um, therefore, it has been found in several trials uh, that metallization, despite of a certain graying of the recyclate, is not harming the recycling. So therefore, also approved uh, for the colored recycling stream. Uh, next picture, please. Yeah, the same concept was also transferred to uh, uh, mono PP laminates we call in consumer Ecover we call in pharma perpetua and also here in the consumer portfolio we have a range of three different barrier categories uh, pretty similar to that what we have done with Ecolam and uh, all the other features are also comparable uh, uh, everybody or most people know the, the properties of polypropylene uh, laminates and the recyclability here is either in a mixed PO stream like defined in countries like Germany or in a PP flexible stream when such a stream is available uh, and uh, Fabrizio will later on give more details on that. Also with the mono PP laminates as you can see in the next slide uh, um, uh, demanding innovations are possible that you cannot find by everybody who's offering mono PP. Uh, we have recently developed um, one product for um, this vacuum coffee packaging where you need uh, um, an additional feature which is also a good deadfold property in order to assure that uh, during the packaging process on the machine we can achieve high speed uh, without any leakages. In the next picture you see another innovative example of mono PP laminates which cannot be realized with uh, PE. It's uh, the product Perpetua Alta. It's a high chemical resistant packaging for sachets or stick packs in the pharma area. Here the filling goods are very often very aggressive and uh, uh, we are proud that we have not only fulfilled all demanding technical requirements with that product but also got recently here the recyclability approval by Recyclas. Next slide please. Yeah so far much for that time here about our product and now let's hear about the recyclers point of view and what uh, the latest uh, development in the packaging waste regulation will mean for all of us and how the journey will go further. Thanks for being here for joining us. 
Thank you, Akim, uh, for uh, your kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, uh, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm really glad to be part of this webinar today because uh, I remember when we started Resiclass, Constancia was indeed uh, one of the first joining the initiative, and uh, Ecolam High Plus was indeed the first receiving uh, a technology approval. So I will go now uh, to give a little bit uh, different angles uh, on the future of flexible film packaging. Uh, uh, and uh, to give a little bit uh, of detail, I would like to start from uh, uh, what is Resiclass and what is the mission and vision of Resiclass. So if we can move to the next slide, uh, just to clarify, Resiclass is an initiative we started uh, uh, to support uh, the plastic value chain uh, to reach uh, plastic uh, a circular plastic future. So the mission of this value chain collaboration is of course to ensure that all the plastic products on the market are recyclable by promoting a transparent uptake of recycled plastics in new products. This is fully in line with the circular economy for plastic. Uh, if we move to the next slides, um, let's go a little bit now in the detail where we are and what is the future of flexible fields. Uh, uh, in 2022, um, the European Commission presented uh, uh, in November the 30 a proposal for the package and pilot waste regulation uh, to the Parliament. Uh, and uh, uh, in this regulation, uh, by uh, 2030, 1st January 2030, all packaging on the market, uh, on the European market, must be recyclable and for plastic packaging, uh, all the plastic packaging uh, has a mandatory minimum recycled content to reach. Otherwise, this packaging will go out of the market. As you can see, the journey uh, to, towards the circularity is quite impressive, uh, but uh, uh, after the official proposal for a packaging by waste regulation, it's uh, more clear what is the ambition. Uh, at least for the European uh, area. Uh, if we move to the next, uh, uh, going a little bit in detail about uh, uh, the recyclability performance grade uh, promoted by the uh, proposal for a packaging piling waste regulation, I was pointing out that by 2030, all plastic packaging uh, on the market uh, uh, must be designed for recycling. Uh, and uh, recyclability will get defined uh, with the five different uh, recyclability performance grade, A, B, C, D, E, uh, that are also related to uh, a minimum uh, threshold, 95, 90, 80, 70, and less than 70 percentage. Where E, uh, with less than 70 percentage, uh, will be forbidden to be placed on the market by 1st January 2030. If you look uh, at the bottom of the slides, you can see that uh, uh, this is exactly what Reciplus is promoting by 2014. So nine years uh, ago, we started with the Reciclus as a, a tool uh, coming from the uh, European plastic recyclers. And the logic was to promote recyclability, not as a binary for plastic packaging, but with uh, a class ranking from A to F where A, uh, B, and C are indeed uh, uh, almost fully aligned with, uh, with the proposal from the Commission. And in any case, uh, from D to F, uh, in Reciclass, we recognize that packaging are downside and uh, or uh, not compatible with recycling. And if you look at the limit of the D-class by Reciclass, is exactly the uh, same threshold uh, that uh, the Commission is going to impose with the regulation. Um, and by 2035, if you look at the right part of the slides, uh, uh, all packaging must be also recyclable at scale, meaning that uh, in, by 2030, all the packaging must be designed to be uh, technically uh, recycled. But then by 2035, we need to put in place a, a further efforts to ensure collection, sorting, and recycling infrastructure capable to um, recycle all the plastic packaging uh, uh, we will place on the market where the recyclability at scale impose a minimum of 75 percentage of the european population if we move to the next slides uh, uh, it's important to underline that for plastic packaging uh, uh, the legislator uh, is looking at the future uh, uh, also by imposing a minimum recycled content 
Uh, and I would like to clarify, this is fully related with the recyclability design, for, uh, design criteria, because uh, a soon use uh, set designed for recycling criteria that are not reliable and not scientific based, then uh, on the market by 2030, we will be, uh, there will be not enough high quality recycled plastics to replace virgin in plastic packaging. So recyclability on one side, recycled content on the other side, but the two targets are uh, uh, interconnected each other because just imposing uh, uh, or setting down a reliable scientific base design for recycling criteria, we will be able by 2030 to replace uh, 30 or 10 percentage or 35 percentage of recycled plastics in plastic packaging. And this is uh, uh, relevant because uh, it's not just for uh, uh, rigids, it's also for flexibles and it's also for uh, contact sensitive products. Then if you look at the vision, the commission is already uh, asking or supporting to replace at least the 50 percentage of virgin plastic from packaging up to 65 percentage for specific packaging sector by 2040, meaning that half up to two thirds of plastic in packaging by uh, 2040 should come from recycled plastic. Going to the next slide, uh, uh, yeah, I would like then to underline how it's important to give credibility to design for recycling uh, uh, guidelines uh, and claims. And this is the reason why we started Reciclas, to work all together, because the goal we have in front of us are impressive, in particular for flexibles, and we can move together just in case uh, we uh, use a scientific-based approach that is the essential of Reciclas. Moving to the next slide, uh, when it comes to the Reciclas approach, uh, you know that uh, more or less in each member state in Europe, we have uh, at least one set of uh, recycling uh, guidelines. Uh, typically uh, generated by local authorities, local institutions, mm. but in Reciclas we are promoting the standardization and harmonization of this criteria from uh, four years now. And uh, uh, the Reciclas approach is always to uh, have behind the guidelines a standardized testing protocols in order to generate uh, data. Uh, and then on the base of the data, uh, uh, define what are the recommendations in terms of compatibility with recycling? In uh, Reciclas, uh, all the technical committees, with the support of Constancia Flexible, so of course from the beginning, has released uh, a set of testing protocols uh, resembling uh, the industrial scale recycling process, as well as the use of recycled plastics uh, in a film to film or bottle to bottle application. And step by step, we have started testing. Uh, different packaging technologies in order to generate knowledge. And with this knowledge in mind, we have developed and updated time by time the guidelines. The guidelines are also used to fuel uh, the Reciclas online tool, that is a free online tool uh, used by more than 9,000 9, packaging scientists uh, to assess packaging for recyclability. Going to the next slide. Um, then I would like to go a little bit in detail about uh, uh, the design for recycling guidelines uh, for flexibles. Uh, in Reciclas, we have a full set of guidelines developed and updated by, by time by time by, by the value chain on the base of the last findings coming from the lab test. We also have guidelines for polypropylene flexibles from the beginning. And uh, the guidelines uh, are always two for each kind of packaging. We have one for natural packaging and one for colored packaging. Moving to the next slides, uh, for example, uh, I would like also to clarify that uh, the uh, level of compatibility with recycling, typically you have in the guidelines as traffic color in green, yellow and red, it's important, but uh, it's uh, uh, more than important, I would say, uh, always to think that we need to design and place of the market packaging uh, just as monomaterial. Uh, when I say monomaterial, I'm really trying to quantify what are, uh, how much are the other components uh, that are not the target polymer. 
because I would like also to remind you that when we're talking about recycling, we're talking about the recycling of the target polymer. For example, in the case of polypropylene films, uh, with the Reciglas approach, the first step is to uh, count one by one uh, all the um, uh, substances coming from, uh, for example, the laminating adhesives, uh, the printing inks, the coatings, the barriers, and so on, to check at the end of the day what, are, what is the minimum threshold of uh, uh, maximum recyclable plastics uh, in the uh, packaging. And we have defined the class A, class B, class C, and so on, with threshold uh, respectively of 95, 90, and between 70 and 90 percentage. Then, just the second step, and we can move to the next slides, is indeed a check on the compatibility with recycling. Uh, what made the, the Reciclass guidelines a little bit special is that, uh, first of all, on top of the guidelines, uh, in the first three lines, uh, you have uh, first uh, uh, once again, uh, the, uh, the description that the guidelines are related to a testing protocols. So the recommendations are not coming from me or from Akim or from Martin, but they are coming really from a value chain collaboration, carrying out a, a test with the standardizing testing procedures. Uh, there is a description of the methodology we are using uh, to link the guidelines with the ABCDEF uh, recyclability uh, score. And also, on top of the guidelines, together with the full limited and low compatibility, you can see that uh, uh, there is always the reference to the minimum amount of recyclable plastics in your packaging to achieve the full, the limited compatibility or the low compatibility. Then the guidelines are also updated time by time. And uh, in front of you, you have the last version of the guidelines we updated in January 2023. Uh, you can find it on the website and uh, uh, you can also uh, go in the link provided with the guidelines in order to get further information about uh, the recent updates. Moving to the next one. As I said, behind the guidelines there are testing protocols. Uh, all the protocols are available online and uh, it's a, a, a standard procedures uh, uh, resembling uh, the industrial scale mechanical recycling process. Uh, so also for polypropylene flexible films, uh, you can see that we have three main steps. Pretreatment steps where the flexible film uh, is first grandly washed. Uh, we apply flotation to separate by density uh, all the separable stuff. And then different blends of materials uh, are prepared uh, in order to extrude the material uh, and uh, um, then analyze the pellets. Uh, after that, uh, the material is far too diluted with virgin uh, and for the production of cast film in the case of PP flexible. Uh, and after a minimum 30 minutes uh, uh, processing or production of films, the films are characterized to check if the uh, increasing by increasing the share of the recycled plastics coming uh, from uh, the sample submitted to the test, there are any specific deviation respect to the control. This is uh, very interesting because it's uh, uh, standard procedures uh, able to simulate not only the real uh, recycling process, but also the use of recycled plastics uh, in packaging to packaging application. Mm, going to the next slide, uh, on talking about polypropylene films, uh, I would like also to give you uh, a little bit uh, overview about where we stand today, because uh, probably you are aware that uh, unfortunately still today in Europe we have a lack of collection uh, as well as sorting and recycling infrastructures. In particular for PP flip films, I would say uh, this is coming from uh, a Plastic Recyclers Europe uh, recent report where you can see that uh, uh, we have no or very few countries uh, collecting the polypropylene films uh, in the household collection. And even when uh, in the member states polypropylene flexibles are collected, uh, we do not have sorting facilities sorting out polypropylene flexible as monostream. So in case polypropylene flexibles are sorted by sorting lines, typically are sorted uh, in mixed polyolefin stream that of course are not aligned at all with the circularity because uh, you, by sorting with the mixed polyolefin stream, you are uh, not uh, keeping the value of the material in circular. 
but we expect by 2025 all, all member states to collect all plastic packaging on the market and because of the boost of the regulation in any case we expect from 2024 to have the first sorting lines and uh, recycling lines fully dedicated to polypropylene flexibles. Going to the conclusion of my presentation, moving to the next slides, uh, also regarding uh, LDPE films, uh, this is, uh, let's say, a more uh, ready um, uh, available approach because LDPE films uh, have a bigger volume with respect to PP flexible. So uh, historically, there was more interest uh, in collecting, sorting and recycling the stream. In the slides, you have some numbers about the household, commercial and agriculture and uh, how much LDPE films is coming uh, uh, from each sector. But and moving to the last slide, uh, the last slide probably, yes, uh, you have also an overview about uh, where the LDP films uh, are collected, sorted and recycled today, uh, with uh, uh, also a, a share about the household film, commercial film, agricultural films and production scrap. Uh, in Reciclas, moving to the last slides, in Reciclas we have developed uh, a couple of guidelines for LDPE films, uh, recyclability of course, and we have also recyclability evaluation protocol for polyethylene film that uh, uh, are available online and updated time by time by the technical committee. So what is the future of flexible film packaging? The future is quite optimistic because uh, 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 Costanza Flexible already proved that uh, technically it's feasible. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Fabrizio, and you have uh, well shown that uh, recyclability is a new must uh, uh, criterion or property which is needed for the packaging. But beside of that, uh, we have not to compromise uh, other properties like protection. You have seen we can achieve really the highest barrier, but what about uh, the behavior on the packaging line and the feasibility of the different packaging materials? Uh, in the next slide, you can see just a, a very uh, small choice of the many, many different packaging formats we have been uh, developed over the last years together with our customers. We have a lot of technical approvals, much more than commercial applications, but even commercial applications, we have uh, uh, more and more uh, numbers of already commercial applications. So I can say that as uh, responsible for our R&D that there is not uh, a real roadblock that not uh, different packaging formats might it be bigger packaging smaller packagings with spout with zipper seal all that seems to be feasible according to our experience and uh, before we are uh, proposing a structure to our customers uh, uh, we do also test with uh, packaging uh, machine manufacturers as you can see on the next slide um, we are testing our structures uh, with uh, uh, the most uh, well-known uh, packaging machine manufacturers up front. We have also a few packaging pilot machines in the company, but uh, in order to use the latest machinery equipment, we go then to the machinery makers. Um, yeah, the so different structures might be duplex or triplex have also passed these tests and those of you who will be at the Interpac at the next will see at Interpac a lot of Ecolam materials and also uh, uh, other materials like Eco Paper running on various machines. Here you can also see that um, the barrier with metallization which is less brittle than uh, Alox or Siox uh, as barrier technology is giving the best barrier and therefore metallization to answer another question which came in in between uh, is an indispensable and recyclable technology so metallized films both in in PE stream and in the PP stream are recyclable as long as we talk uh, uh, the colored and not the transparent stream Next slide, please. Um, you might ask, where is the product available? And we as Constancia do have the clear ambition to make that product available around the globe. You see here in the green factories uh, where we do have uh, MDO, uh, means uh, orientation uh, uh, oriented PE film production lines installed. It's one in India and two in Europe. 
And depending on the region, depending on the volumes, we either install our own assets or we partner with companies operating the, the assets under our license. The red factories are showing the Constantia sites having already experience uh, and customer activities uh, with these products. Therefore, you will find also in the different regions uh, a Constantia site who can serve you with that kind of product. Yeah. But now I have talked uh, enough about runnability on the machine. The real uh, uh, moment of truth is when the lemonade arrives uh, at our customer premises. And I'm happy to welcome here Martin Setter, uh, who will give us some more insights. Uh, yeah, what their experience with the product was and how their strategy on monomaterials looks like. Martin, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hakim. And, and th hello to everybody on the webinar. Uh, so. Um, basically, I want to, if we can go to the first slide, please. There we go. So, basically, um, I want to share my experience of working with the Resi Class tool, the guidelines and, and the calculator, but also the experience with uh, Constantia and the development process of working towards a, a, a P mono material laminate. But to set all that stage up, we wanted to kind of um, give you an understanding of how we view uh, the external drivers for change. We've picked the most um, relevant ones there, the, the, the three plastic ones. There are others. Uh, we've not included the retailers. We've not included the uh, consumers purely because we wouldn't have time and that would take up three or four hours of our time. Um, so what we've considered there are the main influences that have external influence on, on our decisions to move towards uh, monomaterial PE. Um, and we're going to start with the EPR. Next slide, please. So if we look at EPR, EPR is expanding and it's gathering press uh, from its infancy with in the UK and Europe. By uh, 2025, approximately 60% of the world will be covered with a version of EPR, uh, which will expand another 15 to 20% uh, by 2025 and up to 2030 will keep growing. Uh, this is a direct cost to the business um, and it is linked directly to a manufacturer's responsibility for the risk of environmental impact that they produce. And in a nice way, it keeps us all on focus because we will be held responsible for the risk to the environment that our products could pose. So it is becoming more uh, acute, it's becoming more global, and we have to view this as an ongoing process. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There we go. <laughs> so looking at packaging tax, packaging tax is now a reality um, and it's a fact of life. Packaging tax is initially driven by all the work that was happening under the EU under single use plastic uh, and the rollout of the legislation across Europe. But what we find is um, this packaging tax is now gathering pace and it is becoming a global fact of life. And as you can see from on the screen, there's a few examples of packaging tax and the variations in packaging tax based on what is the needs within that particular region and country. And that basically they're trying to drop tax to build their infrastructure to, under, to help maintain a collection resource processing and turning it back into usable secondary plastic. So this is a big influencer on tax. It is driving a lot of changes and Europe is leading the charge with this. Next slide, please. Then we go on to the NGOs. Now the NGOs play a vital role because they've established themselves as the um, gatekeepers of and the piece of sustainability and really have pushed the agenda to uh, make industry more aware of potential issues with the environment but also made us think about how we design products to be uh, friendly for the planet but also user friendly for the consumer and gain understanding uh, they have influence across the range from government um, levels all the way up to the top and across uh, the EU, the United States on federal basis, 
but also drive some of the consumer and the retailer understanding and needs because they're very good at promoting what they want to achieve. Uh, the example shown is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, one of the more dominant NGOs. There are several that we deal with. Um, I just picked on Ellen MacArthur Foundation particularly because the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, part of their process is you have to record your plastic footprint and they really focus on the plastic footprint and you have to show what drives an initiative you have in place to reduce material um, from verging, uh, how are you going to promote and use PCR recycled material and how are you going to make your products more recyclable and what the way they keep us all honest is they publish these figures and they show and they publish on their website so it's open for anybody to look at the data that you provide um, so it's another cross check in the tick that really drives our sustainability because it opens up what we are doing as a strategy is records to drive sustainability and, and make better things. Next slide, please. So those are the influences, some of the influences that drive our decisions to um, make our products more sustainable and more recyclable. Focusing now into plastic and what the, the strategy we've developed on plastic, please remember we are a global company, so our targets are global and where they are regional, they are set to regional standards or above. We focused on three target areas, reduce plastics. And when we say reduce plastics, we mean virgin fossil-based plastics, recycle content and recyclability, which is where uh, ResiClass come in as, as guidance and uh, the tool. Next slide, please. There we go. So, with all that above information and looking for our portfolios and taking a view on what's actually happening in the world, we set these three core projects, core strategic needs for uh, Reckit for Sustainability. So the first one is 50% reduction in virgin material by 2030. This is more of an issue for records than it is for others because of our mixed bag of materials and some of the things that we do we can't just flick a switch and change because we've got other regulations health food um personal care cosmetic regulations to name a few that stop us from doing things immediately so we set quite an aggressive target to try and force the agenda uh, and to push some of the cleaner variants of alternative materials organic PE, those things. Um, it's a global target, so please be aware of that. But the reason we set that is to, to drive innovation within the business. Equally from recycled content, PCR in particular, we've set 25%. Now we set 25% because there's such a variation globally, once you get out of Europe and the UK, on percentage requirements. India has just set theirs at 10% whereas Europe is at 30 escalating to 50. So we've taken a global view um, of what the percentage of PCR should be and what our target should be. Uh, we will be charging towards 30 plus percent and we are uh, across Europe and the UK and whatever the local regional percentage is, is our minimum base target. We always want to achieve more. But PCR is, is both good and bad. Good for it makes us focus on getting recycled material in but also bad because we're held back from using some PCR because of restrictions so hence the global target and hence why we're approaching it in that method recyclable this isn't just being about being recyclable and we say 100% what we really mean is that we can reuse or recycle our products 100% by 2025 this is a very aggressive target uh, and we've done this on purpose to capture e-com but also to capture businesses across the globe uh, in various locations to ensure that they're part of the strategy and we pull them through to make sure that wherever possible we make things recyclable and wherever possible they have a secondary use again it's a target but we quit, we're quite um, bullish on this and, and are driving this through with quite a bit of force next slide please Next slide, please. Yeah. 
but all that did was help us set the foundations so that just gave us an overall view of where the strategy should be who which people we have to uh, have the influence in our decisions and where we should be really focusing our efforts um, this helped us establish the goals set our success criteria and establish as equal as important what is out of scope for any project um, so it really does set the foundation for the uh, the project and the steps we need to take next slide please there we go so what this enabled us to do is is really look at the um the requirements for each individual project so for the, the move away from a multi-layer laminate to a mono-layer laminate, we had to set quite a an aggressive um, requirements and, and pinpoint where the opportunities are. But it still had to be machinable, um, protect the efficacy of the product, run down the lines, and really understand the, the benefits that it gave to us as 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 records. So when we started writing things like research briefs it was based on logical um, requirements built into the wider strategy uh, next slide please and this all fed into the initial goal of moving towards a PE a barrier laminate we took guidance from ready class from the guidelines as well as other organizations such as CFAX and and um, RAP and UK plastic pack but we really wanted to drive through uh, the the needs of the laminate to make sure that we understood the laminate, we understood where it was going from, but we also understood where we were going with the material, why we was picking a PE laminate. And the goal really was to have something that could be recycled, not just technically, but in a practical way, that we understand the other considerations around the packaging film, but we made sure that the product worked and it worked to the requirements we set out for stability and barriers and all those kind of things and the impact on the formula uh, or any changes to the formula were understood and the the material was targeted to fix any of those known or unknown problems at the time uh, next slide please next slide please hello next slide please there we go success criteria so all of that uh with guidance from uh, from, from resi class from guidance from external and internal forces from the strategic point of view enabled us to set out a success criteria for a, a material research brief and basically this set out the key requirements that we had to achieve both for the product and the pack format what products it had to impact. So piece of, if we had PCR in it and PCR was available, what chain of custody and from what source, written confirmation percentage of PCR, recyclability and uh, how we calculated recyclability, um, technical performance criteria. So what barriers, what migration levels, what performance on the machinery, impact on costs and how we use that format to, it, within our products. So really, all the work so far has been logically together as to a success criteria so we can write a material brief. Um, but as well as writing the success criteria um, in the next slide, please pass on to the next slide, it also mapped out the areas where uh, which were out of scope for the brief and materials that we would not entertain um, because they either didn't meet the success criteria of the project uh from guidance from the wrap tool uh and the recyclability and the razor class tools they didn't reach what we needed to do from a recyclability point of view and using the class guidelines uh, all these materials in combinations were taken out of the picture but also to make sure that we aligned to what consumers were telling us but also what retailers were telling us uh and people like the red green and amber guidance that came out from Tesco's and Walmart all specified that P was their preferred option, which was backed up and supported by the work that uh, ResiClass did on PE film collection, being the, the dominant film collection. 
uh, across Europe and the UK. Uh, next slide, please. So this led us through the development partnership with Constantia, through the work we did with Resiclass, from the assessment we did of external work. This led us to a, a, a material mix with Constantia uh, and looking at the Ecolam. We tested it, we retested it, <laughs> and we rechecked it. Uh, we confirm recyclability and its sustainability criteria both internally and with the Resiclass tool. And we also check that externally with a recommended third party recycle auditor to confirm the Resiclass results. And we ended up with a material that works for us as technically recyclable uh, and meets all the requirements and has been certified by a third party to be recyclable for claims on PAC. Next slide, please. But these weren't the only tests we did. Uh, as, as you can see there, that this ju did our driver change in the wrap, um, floor wrap laminate material that we used, away from the PET structure, which at best was classified as mixed material, to a mono PE laminate. Uh, and it was classified as mono PE, even though we had a barrier in there uh, of up to 5% by weight of EVOH shot as an active barrier. Uh, it still met all the requirements for recyclability into razor class, but it also met all the requirements for OPRL, RAP, C-Flex. I'm having to look to look at these, APRL, UKPP and USPP. So by default, we designed a multi-use material in a mono PE. But that's only part of the story. Um, you, you can design a material that works and is recyclable, but it's got to work down the line it's got to work in the pack hall it's got to work in transport so on the next slide please next slide please there we go so on the next slide uh we really pushed the boundaries of what we could do and we we wanted to test it actually in usage so we did line testing to test how it would run down the line so whether the web tension worked whether it would seal we did all the pack testing to make sure that it didn't burst we did all the pack stability testing. So in the stability ovens, we did migration testing, all the testing we could think of plus extras to verify the material. Um, and even at this stage, even with a recyclable material, if it didn't pass this criteria of tests, it would have been a technical success, but it would have been a product failure. I'm happy to say Constancia flew through all these tests on multiple lines. Uh, of going to multiple products and pack formats and gave us initially an opportunity to roll out a mono PE recyclable material that is now certified as recyclable throughout the UK and Europe. And that's the story. It, it's taken us quite a time to do this and it's been quite in depth. Um, but this now is the foundation of our future development is to create even more recyclable products within records. So um, that's my last slide. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'd like to now pass back to Akim, who I think is on the next slide. Yeah, thank you, Martin, for that uh, uh, insights into your journey. On the next slide, you see uh, another recent industrial application. And uh, yeah, it is not always easy to uh, be able to talk about application, but that picture I can show to you and we are allowed to show. Um, that picture is a recent industrialization in South Africa of uh, Ecolam, and uh, it shows here also the very nice printing patterns which have received uh, the gold and silver pack awards. So a good proof that recyclable packaging also uh, can uh, look very aesthetic on the optical way. Let me allow to finalize with a few words on recycling and have a little look in the crystal bowl what's going on with recycling technologies. Uh, on the next slide you can see that Constantia was always seeking to understand the recyclers pain points from the very first beginning. It was some years ago really a reading in the crystal ball. Recycling guidelines have not been clear at all. People that even have tried to defend the PET PE where everybody who knows about plastics was clear that is not a good way to do. And uh, we 
from the very first beginning followed demanding guidelines and uh, we will go further that journey. We uh, have shortly after the risk class approval uh, used our first bigger amounts of production scrap here of different European sites, printed production scrap, as you can see on the right side, and we could in the successfully recycle it on industrial scale and create uh, uh, nice rolls of uh, lamination films with up to 80% of recycled content. Of course, uh, as long as the film is printed uh, or lacquered, uh, you create during the recycling some nayas. So therefore, such post-industrial uh, uh, material cannot go back to food. Only the non-printed material would also pass the food approval. But even the non-printed without metallization is not a problem at all to be recycled. To, to answer another question here. Next slide, please. Yeah. What is possible with mechanical recycling? Um, uh, definitely, new sorting technologies uh, uh, will allow to sort food grades from non-food grades. Hot washing might uh, uh, allow us to remove the odor and the uh, adhering uh, filling goods. De-inking can create transparent recyclates. Yeah? And even the rigid recyclers are sorting the flakes according to color to create not grayish but colored uh, uh, recyclate. It's doubtful if that is uh, economic viable for flexibles. Definitely finer filtration, better degassing, and the increasing use of twin screw machines will increase the recyclate quality. And if I summarize also solvent-based recycling under mechanical recycling technologies, um, then of course, or physical recycling technologies, such technologies could be used for de-inking or decontamination. But even with these technologies, today it is not possible to create out of PCR new food grade quality. That is only possible when using mechanical recycling with PRR. And for me, it is not understandable why the lawmakers are not incentivizing, at least for food packaging, the use of PRR since in the production of the MDO films and the oriented films, we have some scrap which is food approved and it would be only wise to recycle it back. Today, the politicians doesn't give any value to that vision. Another vision is here that when working with stable, thermally stable inks and lacquers, then of course, a uh, uh, higher quality of recyclates and uh, even uh, uh, food might be, according to first lab results, be feasible one day. But for the foreseeable future, mechanical re recycling of PCR cannot uh, create food grade recyclates. And in the next slide, you see some facts on chemical recycling, which is today the only technology allows us to create food grade quality. But some facts are not widely known. Uh, chemical recycling is an energy intensive process. It acts at high temperatures, either via pyrolysis or gasification. And during the process, you have a mixture of different oils, waxes, etc. You, you lose uh, a certain share during the pyrolysis, you lose another share in the steam cracker, so that uh, today's achievable yields are much lower and will remain always lower than mechanical recycling yields. Uh, and it is questionable if one day the yield will be high enough to fulfill, for example, the commission's target of 50% uh, recycling share for food packaging. Another good reason why it would be really stupid to ignore PRR for uh, uh, food packaging as source for recyclates. Uh, and one last fact, which is also not widely known, uh, pyrolysis and chemical recycling of polyfilms is not waste agnostic, so it is not a good idea to have mixed uh, uh, streams with polyester or polyamide in, since they will even further reduce the yield as experts know. The best feedstocks will be the non-avoidable sorting residues uh, we will have in a perfect world in future, working only with mono PE and mono PP. We will always have some mixed PE and PP that would be a perfect feedstock for chemical recycling. I would like to summarize um, with, uh, in the last slide, please. Yeah, you have seen, we have a long tradition on sustainability and started quite early and that was needed to be there where we are today. And together with our customers and suppliers, we have developed a portfolio that needs highest recyclability standards and can be used for 
uh, uh, all thinkable applications. And we are convinced as Constanza, if we do the things right in the complete value chain, including the recyclers, film packaging will have a good future in circular economy. And one right thing we have to do is we should not further try to postpone the definition of recyclability standards. We have discussed in Recyclas and in the Circular Plastic Alliance in detail last year, and we can only hope that this will become as soon as possible an official new standard and we should not wait further years uh, for some delegated acts and use further years to lobby for some exotic materials which harm the recycling. We need clarity on that in order to secure the investments of the recycling and the converting industry and to uh, have also high quality mechanical and chemical recyclates available at affordable costs. Thank you for your attention. And now uh, I hope we have some time for questions. Uh, some of them we might have answered during the talk. Next slide or last slide, please. Yes, thank you very much, um, Achim, and also Fabrizio Martin for a really um, interesting presentation. Um, some some great insights there. Um, we've really had um, many, many questions um, through um, a very, very engaged audience, um, but obviously keep them coming. We'll take note of all of them. And um, yeah, maybe our speakers can get back to you as well afterwards uh, if we don't get around to all of your questions, which with the sheer number we've had, um, we'd have to have another two or three webinars to to answer all of them but um but yeah definitely um keep them coming and um a lot of you have asked about um the on demand recording so yes this record this webinar will is record being recorded and will be available um roughly about 24 48 hours afterwards it will be available on demand so you can access it um anytime and um a lot of you've also asked about slides and um yeah feel free to get uh, in touch with um, Constantia Flexibles directly to um, to get a, a copy of the slides as well. So um, yeah, let's um, head straight into the um, the questions. Um, first question we had is um, why is Constantia Flexibles not working with laminates of mixed PO? Yeah, laminates of mixed PO have, and that we have discussed last year. Uh, in the Circular Plastic Alliance, with attendance from the resin companies as well, uh, uh, mixed PO has inferior mechanical properties. In rigids, that is working since the mixture of HDPE and PP gives a good uh, uh, stiff material which can be injection molded, as companies like MTM have shown. But in flexibles, the mixture is different. It's PP with very floppy uh, and ductile uh, <laughs> metallocene PP. E grades is neither good for the injection molding companies uh, due to the bad flowability nor for the film companies due to the too high gel level as we have also seen in the various uh, tests at Recyclas. Thank you, Achim. And um, another question we had was, um, what about the speed of the packaging lines running with mono PE? Can we expect the same speed as with um, current specs? That is in... Um, in most cases, uh, 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 true, it's possible. In some cases, and in most cases, our customers ask us also to, uh, yeah, to use the existing machines without uh, the need to modify. Uh, in some rarer, fewer cases, uh, we have seen that some slight adaptations on the machine, like cutting knives, etc., are necessary. But uh, generally, yes, that's that's a clear ambition, and in most cases, also possible to run with same machinery at the same speed. Yeah. Thank you. And um, yes, another question we had through: uh, What are the challenges to introducing a flexible PP film stream? Fabrizio, that's yours, I guess. For PP Flexible, uh, uh, as I tried to point out in the slides, uh, uh, I'm quite optimistic because in several member states, uh, uh, PP Flexibles are getting collected. By 2025, all packaging must be collected by member states. And for PP Flexibles, we have the first uh, sorting and recycling lines uh, that will uh, be fully operative uh, in Sweden by 2024. That is uh, just the first good example then to have replication of this uh, proper waste management 
uh, streaming plays uh, overall uh, in Europe. Thank you, Fabrizio. And um, yeah, another question we had, um, what percentage of the total monomaterial produced worldwide is actually being recycled? Maybe one for you or Achim or Fabrizio. Yeah, let, let me start Fabrizio, yeah. So worldwide, the total plastics recycling rate according to different sources is somewhere between nine and 14%. Um, and um, if you look worldwide, uh, there is PE, the material, and the polyester bottles, the both streams being mostly recycled. Um, but the percentages yeah, in Europe, Fabrizio, you have probably more uh, figures on that. Yes, I can, uh, as you said, first of all, to get recycled, uh, a packaging must be collected, sorted, then reprocessed at industrial scale and offered back to the market. So in the place of the world where we do not have collection or sorting, it's impossible to, to, for a flexible film to get recycled. In Europe, where, uh, let's say, we have uh, a very historically good uh, operations uh, for flexibles, we are roughly between 30 and 35 percentage. Thank you, Fabrizio. And um, yeah, somebody wants to um, sort of clarify on, on the subject of monomaterials and is asking, um, when you say monomaterial, do you really mean with no additives whatsoever? Maybe one for you, Achim. Um, when we talk monomaterials, then um, of course, we need some additives along the inks, adhesives, and barrier uh, layers are uh, non-polyethylene uh, or non-polypropylene. So therefore, in most applications, we achieve um, yeah, uh, a PE or PP ratio of more than 90%. And in thicker packaging, uh, also higher than 95. It mainly depends on the total thickness of the pack. Yeah? If you take a very thin crisp pack out of two BOPP films with just 40 micron, and you have five, five gram uh, of inks and adhesive, then of course you can be happy if you're above 90%, uh, while uh, in a thicker pack uh, uh, of more than 100 micron, uh, you are above uh, five, yeah. Thank you. And um, I get also another question on the um, subject of um, recyclability. Um, what is, how do you define, your, what is your definition of recyclable? Which percentage of recyclability do you, do you consider? 100% or less than 95 or 90? Maybe again for you, Martin, um, not Martin, sorry, Achim or Fabrizio. Yeah, in principle, it's it's um, it's a co comparable question than the first one. Um, at the end, there is a, not a black and white uh, scenario. It's more a gray scenario. That's the reason why uh, the Commission has adopted uh, that what uh, RISD class has worked out here with the different ratings, uh, and uh, and therefore um, you are allowed to advertisability. Uh, e.g. via RISC class above uh, 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 from rate A to C, according to the RISC class systematics. Yeah. Thank you. And um, we have another question that is sort of um, a bit more broad, I guess. How do we inform consumers about the benefits of using recyclable plastics rather than moving to other materials such as paper? Many consumers seem to believe that all plastic is bad regarding, regardless of how recyclable it is. Uh, maybe that's one for you, Martin. I was, I was, it was making me chuckle when I was reading it because I get asked this question all the time. Um, Consumers have a different perception from what they listen to and what they, what age group they are, from what information they get. Um, all I'm going to say is it's the right material for the right application for the right product. That's what, the way we should be thinking. Paper has its place, but so does plastic. And you have to educate the consumers on what is truly recyclable and what isn't. And I can't say any more than that because we'll be here for hours, but it's not a straightforward answer. It's a simple question, simple question to that. That makes sense, definitely. Um, somebody's asking a bit more of a specific question. Um, we have a product that requires a 48% moisture content. Is, are your products able to meet this? Uh, maybe one for you, Achim. 
Yes, of, of course, we have uh, uh, many, many different uh, customer projects and, uh, and as I say, technical approvals ranging from dry filling goods requiring high barrier, going to liquid filling goods. Uh, uh, the whole, and that's funny enough, the whole journey and one of the first projects where we started uh, in India uh, uh, was a shampoo sachet and also a shampoo sachet with a liquid in is no, is no problem uh, uh, to be made in mono materials. Uh, no problem after a certain development time. Huh? So Martin has explained that quite nicely. It's, it doesn't happen overnight. Some tests have to be done. Some adaptations on cutting uh, knives of machinery have to be done. Since if you, if you are strolling through the Indian roads, you see uh, you have a certain perforation there and the consumer should perforate the pack uh, between the packs and not the pack itself at the, uh, at the store. Thank you, Achim. And um, another question we had, I think you touched upon in, in your presentation already, but just to reiterate, um, are mono PE or mono PP structures containing metallized films considered as recyclable? Yes, as, as already uh, said in the presentation, uh, it is accepted by RISI class. It's also by other organizations and whoever is doing tests and that was also our own experience when recycling our own metallized oriented film intermediate we could produce an absolute jail-free film metallization alone as only contamination is just creating a grayish color yeah so therefore metallization as long as we are talking printed packaging it's not an issue uh, or it's a lower issue than the inks yeah but for for a transparent stream, uh, Fabrizio and and the recyclers would hate us to put that into a transparent stream. Yeah, but the sorting lines are clever enough to avoid that. Hmm. Thank you, Achim. And um, somebody else is asking: um, Does the color of the PE packaging influence its recyclability? Maybe one for you, Fabrizio. Uh, apart the uh, dark colors or the carbon black that are uh, quite challenging to get sorted or impossible to get sorted with the near infrared technology, I would say that instead of the color, the attention should be on the chemistry of the inks. And uh, this is uh, currently under investigation. We know very well that the chemistry matters a lot. And uh, in RESI class, uh, altogether, we are taking care about uh, how the chemistry of the inks or the binders can impact the quality of the recycled, uh, recycled plastics. Of course, uh, we have different solutions, uh, but for flexibles, let's say that uh, uh, the most useful used uh, one probably are a little bit problematic when coming to recycling today. I'm mainly talking about nitrocellulose binder where we have, of course, polyurethane binder or PDB binder that uh, can perform better. Stay tuned because uh, updates on the guidelines uh, will come uh, soon. Great, thank you Fabrizio. And um, yeah, maybe we have time for a couple more questions before we um, wrap up. And um, they're concerning Ecolam. And somebody's asking, um, are the Ecolam family of products um, lap sealable? One for you, Achim, maybe. Yes, of course, we have also several projects where customers are asking for lab sealability and with the right combination of sealing film and outer printable layer, lab sealability is feasible. Thank you. And uh, yes, one final question. Um, is it possible to recycle the Ecolam film without downgrading? So is it possible to make another film from it? Maybe yes, that's, you, that's, can, that's, I, can that's, I take that's, over, Akim? Because uh, yeah, please. I, I, I mean, yeah. I'm a little bit independent in respect to Costanza, yeah. so yeah. I can tell I can tell the full story short. Yes, uh, film to film, it's possible with Ecolam. Uh, it was proven. Uh, it's public publicly available online from uh, I think uh, three years and half now or more. Uh, we proved that uh, uh, with Costanza Flexibles uh, Ecolam solution. We can go to film to film already today. That is a great uh, technology achievement for the plastic industry. 
Great, thank you Fabrizio. And um, yes, I think on that note, it's um, time to wrap up this webinar. We've got um, lots more questions um, through that unfortunately we didn't get to, but I think we'd have to have another webinar just to answer the questions. But um, obviously feel free to get in touch with the email address you can um, you can see on the screen and um, I'm sure our speakers will be very happy to um, to answer any of your questions. So um, yes, um, once again, the webinar will be available on demand within the next couple of days. So you'll be able to um, reiterate on anything you've seen. You'll be sent a link to access it in case you want to recap. So um, yeah, that just leaves me to thank our speakers, Achim Griefenstein, Fabrizio Di Gregorio and Martin Settel for, um, for a really interesting presentation and a really engaging webinar. Thank you very much, everybody.